Robert Flood, born in 1574 at Millgate House, Bearstead, Kent, was the son of Sir Thomas Flood, a distinguished war treasurer in the Netherlands who had been knighted by Queen Elizabeth. Despite limited information about his early life, Robert's academic journey began at 17 when he joined St. John's College, Oxford, earning his bachelor's and master's degrees between 1596 and 1598. St. John's College, known for encouraging diverse fields of study while focusing on theology, greatly influenced Flood. He maintained a lifelong loyalty to the Church of England, reflecting the impact of his collegiate years. Flood's perspectives were more conservative compared to his contemporaries in the Paracelsian movement, yet his radical ideas still drew attention. Post-graduation, Flood embarked on a six-year European voyage of inner and outer exploration, enriching his knowledge and shaping his interests. This journey led him to explore medical sciences, delving into chemistry and joining Paracelsian medical groups. His fascination with Rosicrucian philosophy also flourished during this period, eventually making him a fervent advocate of the movement. Returning to Oxford, Flood obtained his medical degrees by 1605. His admission to the London College of Physicians in 1609, however, faced hurdles due to his mystical speculations and perceived arrogance. Despite these challenges, he eventually gained fellowship. In London, Flood established a medical practice, employing his own apothecary and managing a laboratory. Here, he continued his alchemical studies and prepared chemical remedies, leveraging his unique blend of traditional and innovative medical approaches. The success of his medical practice was not solely due to his skills, but also owed much to what was perceived as his mystical approach, complemented by a magnetic personality. This combination reportedly influenced his patients' minds, creating a faith-natural state that enhanced the effectiveness of his treatments. Additionally, Flood incorporated unconventional methods into his diagnostic process, such as using a patient's horoscope, which also helped him predict critical days in their treatment. Despite the demands of his medical practice, Flood managed to dedicate time to writing. As an author, he aligned himself with the medical mystics, who professed to hold the key to universal sciences. His involvement with the Rosicrucians deepened during this period, and he is believed to have become an influential member of the Fraternity of the Rose Cross. In the early 17th century, the Rosicrucian Manifestos, the Pharma Fraternitatus and the Confessio Fraternitatus caused a significant stir in Germany and later across Europe. These manifestos were a call for educated individuals to unite in a scientific and spiritual overhaul of Europe. They proposed that through knowledge, humanity could comprehend the divine in nature, differentiate between the material and spiritual realms, and understand their connection to God. The target audience for these manifestos included scholars of alchemy, the Kabbalah, and mysticism. Therefore, it's unsurprising that many who responded were from medical and alchemical backgrounds, with most, like Flood, being adherents of the Paracelsian tradition. A notable aspect of the controversy surrounding these manifestos is their anonymous authorship. Those who replied to the manifestos through letters and pamphlets rarely received official responses. James Brown Craven noted in his writings that between 1614 and 1617, the Library of Gottingen housed a collection of letters addressed to the fictional order of Father Rosie Cross from individuals seeking membership. Others published pamphlets on the subject, and some impostors even claimed to be Rosicrucians, deceiving many. However, no printed responses were made to these letters, and any private correspondence remains unknown due to the secretive nature of such societies. During this era, another Paracelsian physician and associate of Robert Flood, Michael Meyer, explained this secrecy in his work, Silentium Post Clamores. He argued that since ancient times, colleges had existed to advance studies in medicine and science, and such knowledge was protected and passed down secretly through initiation. He perceived a connection between the authors of the pharma and a certain system, though the link was not explicitly direct. This element of secrecy surrounding the manifestos 
elicited varied reactions, ranging from support to allegations of fraudulence. Maya's role in Flood's life is multifaceted. Firstly, his dedication to the spiritual and religious dimensions of alchemy paralleled Flood's interests. Maya is recognized for introducing the Order of the Rose Cross to England and is rumored to have inducted his friend Robert Flood into the Order. Both authors had their works published by de Bry and Oppenheim and employed the same engraver. They significantly influenced each other in their writings on the spiritual rejuvenation of science and medicine and in their involvement with the Rosicrucians. Robert Flood's profound respect and alignment with the principles outlined in the manifestos are evident. His numerous writings that express this admiration led to his recognition as a Rosicrucian apologist. I shall now quote directly from James Brown Craven's book, Flood's Apology for the Brotherhood of the Rosy Cross was first issued in 1616, being printed in Leiden. It entitles him to be regarded as the high priest of their mysteries. It is said that Meyer visited Flood in London in 1615, and the result of his visit was, we know, the publication of his Apologia, written in Latin and published in Leiden in 1616. It is believed that the Apologia was issued at the request of Meyer, and probably he took or sent to Leiden the MS. Flood's studies in mysticism had now continued for several years. Since about the year 1600, he had begun to study the Kabbalah, magic, astrology, and alchemy, as is proved by his Historia Uteruske Cosmi. The Apologia is in three parts. The different chapters have quotations or mottos taken from the Confessio. The contents of the work are the germs of Flood's subsequent writings. These develop his purpose in the Apologia to be to protect the purity and innocence of the society and to wipe off the spots of shame smeared over the brethren as with a stream of pure wisdom. On page 195, Flood addresses the brethren of the Rosy Cross. He refers to their promise to bring happiness to those who have been reduced to misery by the fall of Adam. He honors them because they serve Christ with pure and upright hearts. He asks pardon of the brotherhood if, through his ignorance, he has made any error or mistake in his apologia. He adds, He wished nothing more or better than to be only the lowest associate in your order, that he might satisfy the inquisitive ears of men by a trustworthy spreading of your renown. Flood then states shortly who he is. I am, he says, of a distinguished noble race. My spouse is called Desire of Wisdom. My children are the fruits produced by it. I have experienced and fortunately overcome the stormy sea, the steep mountains, the slippery valleys, ignorance on land, and the coarseness of the towns the haughtiness and pride of the citizens, avarice, faithlessness, ignorance, foulness, almost all human inconveniences. I have found that almost everywhere vanity rules and triumphs. All seems to be self-assertive misery and vanity itself. He then bids the brethren farewell, in all kindness and affection. Robert Flood's deep spiritual devotion and mystical journey led him to a continuous exploration of the human understanding of the creation myth. In 1617, he released two works on the subject. The first, Tractatus Theologo-Philosophicus, discusses life, death, and resurrection, offering a mystical, alchemical interpretation of creation merged with his mosaical philosophy. As a retelling of Genesis, it describes creation, the garden, Adam, and the fall. It begins with the premise that God, the Word, and Light are the origin of the universal life, and the Devil is the origin of death. As an alchemical interpretation, it deals with the separations as a chemical process, or high chemical virtue, that affected the separation of one region from another. Quite simply, Earth is dense water, and water is dense air. Air is nothing else than dense and crass fire. In his writings, Robert Flood consistently emphasized the theme of divine light as the fundamental force in creation. He portrayed Adam as a divine animal whose mind was a luminous palace and an impeccable creation of God. Flood 
linked the resurrection to a return to this pristine state, preceding the fall of man. A notable aspect of Flood's work is its dedication to the Brotherhood of the Rose Cross. Flood held that the true Sons of God were embodiments of light within the Word, and he esteemed the Brethren of the Rosy Cross highly, attributing to them supreme virtues and a brilliance surpassing the morning sun. He proclaimed, Leonem Fortissimum Solem Devorantem, emphasizing their mastery of true alchemy. Flood's discourse culminates with a reference to the farmer, where he describes a heptagonal monument in a famed vault, illuminated by a celestial sun at its apex. Here, he recounts the discovery of Brother R.C.'s body and the inscription, Jesus Mihi Omnia. These themes persist in Flood's subsequent works, notably in Utriusque Cosmi Maioris Scilicet, et minoris metaphysica physica atque technica historia, published in 1617. This extensive work explores the history of the macrocosm, starting from the primordial abyss and the initial light, through the differentiation and diversification of the universe to the human microcosm. It illustrates the division between the earthly realm of elements and the higher celestial realms, based on the premise that all creation stemmed from God's light. As the light extends into the darkness, it becomes increasingly subdued by it. Flood describes this process as not merely linear, but as an outward and inward emanation, suggesting that everything is simultaneously a macrocosm and a microcosm. As man is a microcosm to the greater cosmos, he is also a macrocosm to the cells of the body, and the cells are a macrocosm to another microcosm until all circles are complete. In all realms of creation, there are beings, angels in the Empyrean world, stars, planets, and demons in the ethereal, and the elemental world of men, plants, and minerals. In Robert Flood, hermetic philosopher and surveyor of two worlds, Jocelyn Godwin writes, all these creatures partake of God's light in measure according to their place on the hierarchy. But there is one level in particular which, though not at the top of the hierarchy, is nevertheless particularly favored by God. This is the sun, which is placed at the crucial midpoint of the chain of being, where spirit and matter are in perfect equity and balance. All these beings are within a hierarchical structure and have within them a corresponding degree of light, or they are beings who serve the devil with their corresponding degree of darkness. The sun is a midpoint of these realms and is considered by flood to be the tabernacle of God. When the initiate comprehends the midpoint, he may recognize instantly those who serve the light and those who serve the dark. However, the infallibility and purity of this recognition is only by the acceptance of the midpoint at the center of their being, which reflects the tabernacle and leads them to the embrace of the Alpha and the Omega. This macrocosmic history is dedicated to God and secondly to King James. Interestingly, his dedication to King James included a defense of the Rosicrucian Brotherhood, a Declaratio Brevis, the purpose of which was to defend the society from the suspicions of theologians. This work was never completed and was supposed to have been in two volumes, the first to contain two treatises and the second, three. What was completed was not finished until 1624. It appears his views were based on a combination of scriptural, hermetic, and alchemical authorities. Flood thus believed that humankind should base their knowledge on revelation as seen in the Holy Scripture and in nature, or God's book of creation. His mosaical philosophy, as stated earlier, was also tied in with the mystical alchemical interpretations frequent among the Paracelsian of the time. Further, he often refers to Hermes Trismegistus in his works. James Brown Craven writes, Flood starts with the hypothesis that all things were completely and ideally in God and of God before they were made, that from God all things did flow and spring, namely, out of a secret and hidden nature to a revealed and manifest condition. God formed a thought in his mind which was the structure and form of the macrocosm, and through the power of love, the thought was brought into existence. 
This bringing forth was through a series of circles. Circumferences and circles are important images throughout the copperplate illustrations of Historia. The title page shows a diagram of the macrocosm and microcosm surrounded by an abundance of cloud. The circle is encompassed by a cord wrapped four times and pulled by a winged creature with hoofs, and on his head is the sand glass, depicting time. Most of Flood's illustrations represent the universe as a series of circles, each surrounding the first, much like looking down into a spiral. He borrows from Trismegistus to illustrate the concentric flow, arriving at the deep conclusion that God is the center of everything whose circumference is nowhere to be found. Flood also uses other images such as triangles and squares. In the first chapter he describes nature as Spiritus Imenius Ineffabilis. God, depicted as a triangle, is the artificer of all, and man is the image of God. God is also depicted as the triangle within a circle. Inside the triangle are three inner circles, elemental, ethereal, and angelic. Godwin writes, The light triangle of the Trinity represents God, who remains beyond all things, entering the black hole of matter. As a result, three worlds arise. In the center is the Tetragrammaton. The images of the circles and the triangle are of interest to us as we recall a triangular altar with three orbs, and that matter manifests according to the triangle, and life according to the ideal of the circle. Flood then describes the threefold manifestation. The first material of the earth was formless and void, surrounded by darkness. From the chaotic abyss, light emerged and order began. That is, order came from chaos by the light acting upon it, and substance was formed. Light, always a central theme with flood, is pure fire. Craven writes, It is light which gives the angelic world its glory and splendor. God dwells in light inaccessible. Thus, the light is the life of men. The purer part of the elementary substance rose into the upper, the heavenly and more divine part of the macrocosmos, but the denser remained below. This applies also to angelic existences and to the nature of man. The macrocosm has three regions. The highest includes the heavens of the Trinity is formed of perfect light and purest spirit. The middle is the place of the stars, the state of lesser light, neither very gross nor very subtle. The lower is itself divided into three parts. The first is the tabernacle, the second is the earth, and the middle is the region of water and air. The archetypical world remains in the divine mind. Again, these concepts are illustrated by circular forms depicting the circular progression in the universe, a concept founded in Tractatus in which Flood described the operation of God's order through the circumgyration of his threefold light. The next book in the macrocosmic history concerns the Pythagorean concept of the music of the spheres, or sound created by the movement of the heavenly bodies and which makes the universe one musical instrument. Earthly music is only the faint tradition of the angelic state. It remains in the mind of man as a dream of, and the sorrow for, the lost paradise. The music is produced from the impact upon the paths of the planets, which stand as chords or strings, by the cross-travel of the sun from note to note, as from planet to planet. Flood illustrates his point with a diagram of a sphere covered by an instrument with only one chord. The sun is the center of the picture. The different circles represent the issuance of the different notes. To each member of each realm is assigned a note low G for Earth up through high Q for the highest division of the angelic world. Later in the microcosmic history, Flood continues this concept to show that the same divine harmony influences the interior of the anima humana. The microcosmic reflection of the threefold division, or Holy Trinity, is made complete by the heavenly music of the divine essence which illuminates the opaque body and creates a harmony between body and soul, and makes it complete. 
The next part of the treatise concerns the creatures of the angelic and ethereal worlds. In the angelic world, there are nine good demons in the hierarchy. Seraphim, cherubim, thrones, dominions, virtues, powers, princes, archangels, and angels. The creatures of the ethereal world are light, stars, planets, and spirits. In Greek mythology, daemons are any of the secondary divinities ranking between the gods and men. Lucifer has his own nine orders with named princes, Beelzebub, Python, Belial, Asmodeus, Satan, Meririm, Abaddon, Astaroth, and Mammon. This implies the concept of correspondences between the lower and upper worlds. In other words, we do not turn our back to an evil earthly life and rise up to purely positive higher realms by a simple act of will. Rather, according to the dominant note within our natural, intelligent and spiritual self, we correspond to the country of which we are citizens. The return to the Palace of Light is by the mystical process of purification. Blood then describes the anima mundi. As man has a soul, then must the macrocosmos muse have a soul too. As above, so below. As within, so without. This supreme intelligence is of an angelical nature. God is all and in all and above all, and that in him are all things and in his spirit and word all things consist. God is in everything that existeth, seeing that from him, by him, and in him are all things. The notion of anima mundi, or world soul, sparked considerable controversy for Robert Flood, attracting criticism and allegations of heresy, a point we'll delve into subsequently. Intriguingly, Flood's depiction of the anima mundi in his plate bears a striking resemblance to the imagery described in chapter 12 of the Book of Revelation, underscoring a fascinating parallel between his work and this biblical text. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. The third chapter deals with the origin and diversity of the macrocosm, and Flood uses an image that is repeated later. The sun, Flood considers, is the center and fountain of all life, all heat proceeds from it, and there has God placed his tabernacle. It must have a center, and there God dwells. Divine power issues forth from the sun, thus the heavens declare the glory of God. The sun is full of essential divinity, and took its origin when the light, which was expansed over all the heavens in place of the sun, was in the fourth day of creation. Positioning the tabernacle of God in a realm more ethereal than Earth, yet less so than the outer planets, sparked several inquiries. To address this, Flood proposed the sun as an alternate abode for God, metaphorically speaking. In his subsequent defenses of his concepts, he pointed out that God often operates through indirect means. One notable illustration, named the central sun, features concentric circles representing the elements of fire, air, water, and earth, with the sun positioned at the core. Godwin writes, Flood derived this image from an alchemical experiment that he witnessed performed by a friend and describes in detail the battle of elements which was reproduced in the vessel. At the end, he says, they extracted from the center of the mass a solar substance, a precious gem like Lucifer fallen from heaven. Perhaps this experiment is reflected in Flood's alchemical interpretation of creation. In Robert Flood and his philosophical key, Alan G. Debus states the following. After the three stages, the darkness of the lower region was treble after your second heaven's perfection. The resultant chaos therefore contains the three true elements, fire, humidity, and earth, and from them proceed the animal, vegetable, and mineral kingdoms. This mystical alchemical account of Genesis also explains the major concentric spheres of our world. The initial segment of Historia concludes with a comprehensive exploration of the elemental realm, encompassing largely inanimate entities such as minerals, metals, and a variety of plant life. 
Historia Technica, the second part, made its debut in 1618, featuring a significant focus on universal arithmetic, elaborately spread across 11 volumes. Following this, in 1619, Thomas Secudus, a subsequent volume of Historia, was released. This volume is structured into three distinct sections. Its cover art depicts a nude young figure at the center of a circle, symbolizing the microcosm. The narrative of the work commences with a solemn prayer, expressing profound gratitude to God for his boundless mercy and benevolence, acknowledging him as the unfathomable architect of humanity. Flood emphasizes the importance of human reverence and adoration towards God, highlighting the divine endowment of life's breath bestowed upon mankind by God. He writes, Tu solus, tu ter maximus, O Jehovah. He is God, whose ineffable name shall be blessed forever. The power of Jehovah was one of the deepest realizations of Flood. He then looks to the cause of discord in creation. Craven writes, Although God in the Most Holy Trinity is the original of concord, the devil, on the other hand, is the parent of discord. Thus, the strife between concord and discord produced between light and darkness. From this discord, introduced into the heavenly music and perfect progression of the spheres, has come the fear of death, the fall of Adam. Hence, bad is taken for good, hence the love of the world and vanity, hence the hatred of God, the Creator. However, the pure soul can rise and be guided by the rays of wisdom to discern the path of rectitude. The divine architect who formed the universe made man equally perfect and complete, the image of his own greatness. The circle of existence was made complete. The circle of existence which formed the worlds, formed man. What perfection the world received, that also did man receive. Heaven and earth have their counterparts in the body and soul of man. As the universe is one, so body and soul are one. Thus man is properly called the image of God, the other world, microcosmos. So man, regularly proportioned, can be bounded by a circle, at the center of which are the organs of reproduction. Thus is man the mundus minor. As a microcosm, man reflects the threefold nature of divinity in terms of reason in the head, feeling in the heart, and the means by which they emanate, so that the reason and feeling ultimately form a single unity by virtue of the third power. Further, as the sun is the tabernacle of God and mid-region of the macrocosm, so the heart is the tabernacle of man and his center. Our heart then can become to us our personal and immediate pathway, awareness, and realization of God's presence within us. The soul of man is united with the deity, and various physical attributes are related to the angelic world. For this reason, in contradistinction to the lower creatures, he lifts his head upward, in ascertaining man's position as microcosm, he is to face the East. Robert Flood makes a distinction between what are the mortal and immortal parts of man. As stated, the soul is related to God. Our animal part belongs to nature and returns to the dark regions as dust to dust. The spirit of life, the vital spirit, or we would call it the vital life force, is the central part. It is ethereal and is connected both with the true mind and the animal spirit. It is that life which is the cause of all the functional aspects of life. Robert Flood writes, No, truly, that man is framed and consisteth of flesh and an inward soul, and that either of this too hath his bliss and pleasure apart, for as much as the highest happiness and goodness of the soul is God himself with the mellifluous influence of his sweetness. But the chiefest solace and pleasure of the flesh is the world with his delightful concupiscences. Again, consider that the world is but an external object, when contrarywise nothing is more internal and present with man than God, being that in him are all things, and again he is exterior to each thing, in so much as he comprehendeth and is above all things. If God then be all in all, above all, without all, and that be unity, why shouldest thou so wickedly tear and rent that unity and goodness of God in pieces? In other words, 
The vital life force is the midpoint between cosmic consciousness and Christ consciousness. Cosmic consciousness being the consciousness of the cosmos, the physical universe, matter, and its inherent underlying energies. Christ consciousness being the perfected consciousness of the divine mind in man. Therefore, the vital life force delivers to man in potentiality all manifestations, both physical and spiritual. It is the part of unity that we seek. The marriage of the bride and bridegroom is therefore the goal of true alchemy. The concept of the three in unity, whether we look at the three phases of consciousness, the three points of the triangle, the threefold light, or yod he -Vau, is a recurring theme with flood and is reflected by other mystical writers as well. Philo said that there were three kinds of life, that which concerned God, that which was the creaturely life, and the intermediate life which combined the two. The soul of man, says Flood, also has a threefold nature, corporal, spiritual, and intellectual. The divisions in Flood's philosophy operate within realms of color and sensation, leveraging attributes of perception, spiritual analogies, and introspective contemplation of virtues. Technica Historia is divided into seven segments, encompassing prophecy, geomancy, memory, astrology, physiognomy, palmistry, and pyramidology. Flood reintroduces the principle of correspondence in divinatory practices. He emphasizes that possessing prophetic abilities doesn't inherently signify benevolence, nor does it guarantee the positivity of the revelations. This distinction is crucial and timeless, resonating with contemporary beliefs and practices. It implies that claims of channeling entities or spirits, or invoking angels, should be approached with discernment. Accepting such claims without skepticism could be naive, especially when assuming that all disembodied entities are benevolent. Flood suggests that a prophet with a pure heart imbued with divine spirit, can convey God's will. Conversely, he warns that malevolent spirits, influenced by demonic forces, may also infiltrate individuals to predict events. According to Flood, as explained by Craven, even in pre-Christian times, each individual was believed to be accompanied by both benevolent and malevolent spirits. Consequently, a person's ethical stance and intentions influence the nature of the messages they receive. Flood advises aspirants in these practices to cleanse their hearts of sin and evil, thus preparing themselves to receive divine illumination in their souls. Craven writes, The spirit of lying prophecy cannot stand in the presence of God, but by the light and power of Jehovah is silenced. Otherwise, a person may find themselves speaking with gods they do not know. While some prophets may see clearly the divine light immediately from God or through angels, there are also false gods who have no mission for God, nor angels, but from Lucifer. Twelve laws are given to distinguish true from false prophets. The doctrine of correspondence also indicates that on every level of the hierarchy from the mineral upwards, there is a reflection of the next highest realm. In other words, Minerals such as gold or plants or herbs will contain within them certain attributes of an archetype that will imbue the person wearing or consuming the element certain corresponding effects, which in turn prepares them to exercise a certain art. A point to remember is that in the time of flood, the exercise of certain arts was confined to a relatively small group. The eminent members of this assembly were deeply religious, dedicating their lives to spiritual purity, their faith and principles likely served as a protective barrier against mental disarray. Nevertheless, Flood emphasized to his audience the importance of maintaining a pure heart, a notion that prompts curiosity about how he might advise in today's era where arcane knowledge and magical methodologies are as readily available as dialing a hotline. In the concluding section of his second treatise, Flood delves into theosophical and Kabbalistic themes. He encourages readers to perceive the fiery symbols of the Holy Trinity within Hebrew characters. He elucidates upon the ten sephirot, interpreting them as beams of light from the sun, 
symbolizing a luminous cloak worn by Jehovah. The Tree of Life serves as a graphical representation of his prior discussions on hierarchical structures and various realms. Here, the divine light re-emerges as a central motif, representing the unseen Word of God. Craven adds, The universal and mystical Word, the light uncreated, is exhibited in universal nature by the watery mem and the igneous shin. So we are to venerate Jehovah as revealed in the light of the sun, moon, and stars. In them, by them existing and existing beyond all and in all, his power is seen both in macrocosm and microcosm, even in the fire of Gehenna. Flood ends this section acknowledging that his efforts may be met with mockery, but they were done in good conscience and patience. He does not seek riches, but only desires to peacefully serve God. Flood was correct in his anticipation that his work would be criticized and with great severity. Marin Mersenne, a French scientist and author, leveled significant accusations against Robert Flood, branding him a magician, atheist, and heretic. Mersenne, particularly in his commentary on Genesis, challenged Flood's alchemical interpretation of creation. He acknowledged the importance of alchemy but argued for its separation from theological discourse, preferring its application in medicine and science. Mersenne's discomfort also extended to Flood's portrayal of Christ within the angelic realm, deeming it as diminishing Christ's divinity. In response, Flood clarified that Mersenne had misinterpreted his views. He elucidated that a singular principle takes varied forms across different realms and likened the angelic world to a mirror reflecting the first light, essential for creation and symbolizing the concept of second causes. In Flood's era, accusations of heresy, magic, or atheism were gravely serious. Despite these charges, Flood's writings reflected his deep belief in God and his commitment to the Church of England. His openness to other religious perspectives was evident as he tutored relatives of the Pope and other Roman Catholic youths. He also maintained connections with the bishops of England and enjoyed the patronage of King James. Flood speculated that Mersenne's accusations might have stemmed from a desire for him to convert, a reflection of the then prevalent religious conflicts. Flood's receptiveness to different faiths amidst such opposition highlighted his remarkable tolerance and open-mindedness. It took several years before Flood addressed Mersenne's accusations. In a book defending his views on Genesis, he reiterated the harmony between the macrocosm and microcosm as a universal model, asserting that his angelic world concept was unrelated to magic or heresy. Flood emphasized his allegiance to the universal church, dissociating from Roman Catholicism, and fervently denied the accusations, invoking divine judgment on his sincerity. In his prayer to the eternal wisdom, dwelling in light eternal, the spotless mirror of God's majesty, Flood sought vindication. In 1629, he published Sophia cum Moria Certamen with an attached folio, Summum Bonum, under the pseudonym Joachim Fritius. Although Flood initially denied authorship, most scholars believe he wrote it. The work, symbolically represented by a rose on a cross stem, bees, beehives, and a spider's web, delved into alchemy and defended the brotherhood of the Rose Cross. Summum Bonum explored the essence of magic and the Kabbalah, the nature of true alchemy, and the philosophy of the Rosicrucian fraternity. It presented the Rosicrucian spiritual abode, not as a physical location, but as a metaphysical spiritual house of wisdom, with Christ as the cornerstone. Flood differentiated between divine and foolish magic, arguing that not all magic is condemned in Christian doctrine. He referenced the Magi visiting Christ as an example of God's acceptance of certain secret arts. Flood or the author concludes with a summation that he addresses to the most Christian readers. 1. That all Christians are said to be living stones, they bear the same name and are the same in significance as S. Peter. 2. That all Christians are stones, members of the great Petra Catholilka, it follows that no single man, not even S. Peter, can alone be said to be the foundation of the Catholic Church. 
3. As Christ lay hidden in the rock of Moses, and as the spiritual body lies hidden in the natural body, so the words of the apostle are true, the letter killeth, but the spirit giveth life. 4. The true cornerstone is Christ. 5. The Incarnation opened the way to the knowledge of what that cornerstone is. 6. Vain, therefore, are all traditions and teachings that would persuade us that Cephas was this foundation. 7. God, having willed to the tabernacle amongst mortal men, uses the same imagery and confirms its explanation as now given. Listen, says the prophet, and see the rock from which ye were hewn. True alchemy is then treated. Our gold is not the gold of the vulgar, but the living gold, the very gold of God. There is a spiritual chemistry which purges by tears, sublimates by manners and virtues, decorates by sacramental graces, makes even the putrid body and the vile ashes to become living, and makes the soul capable of contemplating the things of heaven and the angelic world. This is the application of spiritual chemistry, by which, through the power of resurrection, will confirm unto the end. The writer then takes up the cause of the brethren of the Rose Cross. The writer states that he had already defended the brethren in a previous tractate, a reference that leads Craven to conclude that both writers were Robert Flood. The similarity of the two pieces, Sophia and Summum, put together also suggests the same author. Flood maintains that throughout history there has been a continuity of men who turned away from the gross and material in order to dedicate themselves to the spiritual life and investigation into the mysteries. These people have been few in number. Yet a few seek the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God, the hidden manna, the white stone, the white vesture. Their names are written in the book of life, and they become pillars in the spiritual temple. These indeed inhabit the house of wisdom, which is founded on the mount. Mersenne had also accused the Rosicrucians of being heretics and blasphemous, and he challenged them to reveal their dwelling place. To this, the writer of Summum Bonum replies, The house of the Rosicrucians is the house of the Holy Spirit. It is not a house made of stone, and again a stone cut without hands, nor is it a house built by magic or false alchemy, but rather, it is a spiritual house. The house of wisdom, built upon the rational mount, or rock spiritual. The house constructed by the brethren, then, is on the spiritual rock and is built up of the mystical stones of wisdom. It is the mystic castle of Bethlehem, an elect nation who shall reign as kings and priests, called from darkness to light, who were once not a people but are now the people of God. These are they that have put off the mortal clothing and put on the immortal and have confessed the name of God. Now are they crowned and receive palms. They are called the sons of God, the elect of God, prophets and friends of God, the Fraternitas Christiana. It is this type of reference that added to the debate of whether or not the brotherhood was visible or invisible. In anticipation of this, the author wants to reassure the reader of the actual existence of the Brotherhood and appends a letter supposedly written by an actual member of the Order to an initiate. It was written and sent by ye brethren of R.C. to a certain Germain, a copy whereof Dr. Flood obtained of a Polander of Dantzische, his friend. The immovable palace of the brethren is declared to be the center of all things. It is the resplendent and invisible castle which is built upon the mountain of the Lord, out of whose root goeth forth a fountain of living waters and a river of love. Other writers published charges against Flood in addition to Mersenne. Like Mersenne, they objected to an alchemical interpretation of the Bible, the notion that Christ was reduced to a mere angel, and Flood's concept of the anima mundi caused some discomfort as well. The problem arises when one tries to interpret a mystical analysis in a literal way. Flood explains to his critics that alchemy is a part of natural philosophy. It is the division of the pure from the impure, light from darkness, sin and vice from goodness and virtue. 
True alchemy seeks to comprehend the creation and spirit of life and serves as a key to understanding both. In terms of the creation, the separation of light and dark was set into motion by the eternal fiat. There are places in Flood's writings that could indicate a leaning toward a pantheistic point of view. Some writers have argued that he concluded that God is identical to matter. For example, Flood held that all things were of God before they were made. From the blaze of power, life vibrates from the center to the circumference. However, he also explained this as being a thought. He felt that all things owe their existence to God, but that does not necessarily conclude that God owes his existence to all created things. In other words, physical matter, through the theory of emanation, may be a manifestation of God, but is by no means the whole of God. Craven maintains that Flood would have answered this debate by saying all things are full of God, as opposed to all things are God. Flood is clear when he says, God is all and in all and above all. Examining Robert Flood's concepts through the lens of the first degree offers insight into his unique interpretation of the triune expression, symbolized by three circles within a triangle. In other words, if Flood's critics were alive today, they might object to our saying that there is a vibrating spirit in matter that holds it together. They might look at us as saying that is the entirety of God. We, however, know that indicates one aspect of a triune expression, or to use Flood's visuals, reflects only one of the three circles. His critics were also unhappy over Flood's concepts of the angelic world, and again felt he placed Christ in this realm. However, Flood clearly illustrates a hierarchical structure, and even though demons like the Seraphim and Cherubim watch over a planetary structure, they are not necessarily the same as the divine or absolute principle. To be sure, Flood maintained a soul of the world. This soul was the cornerstone of the universal Petra upon which the church was built, the Philosopher's Stone, signified by Christ both divine and human, the cornerstone having its effect in both the macrocosm and microcosm. This hardly reduces Christ to the celestial realm. Further, Flood believed that Christ was part of the infinite Godhead. The realm of God has no beginning and no end. The temporal world has a beginning and an end, and the angelic world has a beginning but no end. Therefore, by Flood's own divisions, he could not have reduced Christ to the angelic realm. However, images Flood used, such as the previously mentioned Venerate Jehovah in the Moon and Stars, probably led his critics to this conclusion. They took him literally and not metaphorically. Again, the image of divine light is a central theme. Fire represents the first cause. Therefore, a physical manifestation such as a fiery star would represent to Flood a metaphor for the divine principles of fire and light. Flood felt that God worked in the world through second causes, and his depiction of their realms led his critics to believe that he equated the second causes as being identical with the first cause. Craven quotes Hargrave Jennings from his book The Rosicrucians, where he interprets Flood's ideas on this subject. The Rosicrucians, through Flood, declare in accordance with the Mosaic account of creation, which they maintain is in no instance to be taken literally but metaphorically, that two original principles in the beginning proceeded from the Divine Father. These are light and darkness, or form or idea, and matter or plasticity. Matter downwards becomes fivefold as it works its forms according to the various operations of the first informing light. This produced the being, or thought, to whom or to which creation was disclosed. This is properly the Son or second ineffable person of the Divine Trinity. Robert Flood wrote scientific, medical and alchemical books in addition to his philosophical writings. He was consumed by his work and this feverish pitch may have contributed to his death, the cause of which is not known. He knew he was in a weakened state and that his time was soon to come. He methodically arranged his affairs and had prepared a special stone for his grave. He died September 8, 1637, and was buried in Bearstead Church. 
Even though Robert Flood was devoted to the church of his baptism and was a religious person, he was also very independent from exoteric religion and recognized wisdom from a variety of sources. He embraced his church rather than reject it, yet he transcended the theological concerns of the day by incorporating many different points of view. In keeping with the continuous images he used of expanding and concentric circles, Flood sought an expanded and inclusive view of the greater world. He wished to see the spiritual world directly through metaphor, personally through ascension and intellectually through science. He was a medical doctor and a Paracelsian, yet he incorporated new alchemical ideas into his traditional and chosen profession, rather than try to destroy a tradition of which he was a part. We might even describe him as a Rosicrucian who lived by evolution, not by revolution. As a writer and thinker, Flood was unique. He lived in a time to see a separation in the world of medicine and the world of philosophy. His medical art may have seemed of the old way as he depended upon astrology, and his religious views were founded to a great extent in geocentric theories. Yet, he had his feet on two realms of history, one from the old and one facing towards a future. Flood lived in a time where there was a great crack in the cosmic egg, new light poured into the minds of men, the old ward for the status quo, the new ward to bring in change. Flood stood at the center of his being, at the center of his beliefs, and in the center of his dedication to the truth in healing and the truth to knowledge. He sought only to serve God and his creation. He saw God in all things. The intensity of reverence which saw the hand of God in everything and his sacred presence generating preserving and controlling all, in an absolute nearness and actual filling of all in all, was the key to Flood's character and writings. His connection with the Rosicrucian controversy arose from the deep respect in which he held his instructor, Michael Meyer, and that cast of mind which saw wonders in nature, which to most were but the outcome of common operation. That a society of the nature of the Rosy Cross existed and that both Maya and Flood were initiates, need not, I think, be now doubted by any disinterest students of the history of those wondrous 16th and 17th centuries. What its origin may have been, we shall, I suppose, never know with any certainty, though there is some ground for supposing that it was in existence in the latter part of the 18th century. Its whole story is one of the most curious episodes in history. Robert Flood, never married and left no heirs. But the real successors of a writer like Flood will be found in those who, assimilating his thoughts and their results, hand on to others the encouraging hope that a time will come when all the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Rosicrucians can also be said to be his successors, for Robert Flood left us much he defended the fraternity by saying the brethren did not seek the vulgar gold, but progress in virtue, by sublimation, by tears, by the inhaling of the divine breath of God. Thus will the soul be sublimated, rendered subtile, able clearly to contemplate God, be conformed to a likeness with the angels. Thus, apparently dead, lifeless stones become living and philosophic stones. Such are the opinion and methods of the brethren. Such is the alchemy and process referred to in their confession. Let us pay respects to his legacy by ending with some powerful words from Robert Flood himself. Farewell, my friends, let plain simplicity be still your guide to lead you in your race. So shall you near approach to unity and evermore obtain from him his grace. For double dealers, false and treacherous men, will quickly be entrapped in error's den. If you want to delve deeper into the world of ancient wisdom and esotericism, be sure to like, share and subscribe to the channel for more insightful videos. And if you want to support my mission to unearth and decipher the forgotten teachings of the ancient mysteries and the encrypted knowledge of Western esotericism, consider becoming a Patreon supporter. Until next time, continue to seek out the light. And to pan.